All right. I also want to welcome everyone else who's come to present um, and to learn. Um, it's an honor to be here, and I appreciate you by inviting me back year after year. This presentation is called The Future is Now, Precision Genomic Addiction Medicine. It's based upon... Um, I've got to move something so I can see. It's based upon an article uh, entitled The Future is Now for Precision Genomic Addiction Medicine as a Frontline Modality for Inducing Dopamine, Dopamine Homeostasis in Reward Deficiency Syndrome. And we were lucky enough to have that published by the current Pharmaceutical and Biotechnology Journal. This was a team a project which took a few years from conception to online publication before print. Uh, it's the synthesis of 181 research publications and the scientific team collaborating on this project includes Dr. Ab Abdullah Biroet, representing the Department of Biology and Adelson School of Medicine from Ariel University in Israel, Dr. Ashim Gupta, representing Future Biologics, Dr. John Giordana, affiliated and representing the National Institutes of Holistic and Addiction Studies in North Miami, Dr. Katherine Dinan, representing Department of Family Medicine from Jefferson Health Northeast in Philadelphia, Dr. Eric Braverman, representing the Kenneth Bloom Institute of Behavior and Neurogenetics, Dr. Rajana Badgayan from the Department of Psychiatry at University of Texas in San Antonio. And he also represents the Department of Psychiatry from Mount Sinai University. Dr. Thomas McLaughlin is also representing the Kenneth Bloom Institute of Behavior and Neurogenetics. David Barron represents the Division of Addiction Research and Education for the Center of Psychiatry at Western University Health Sciences. And Dr. Kenneth Bloom, of course, the father of reward deficiency syndrome, he's actually presenting uh, before Congress today and then later the United Nations. Um, and I need to ask the tech if this slide is being interrupted. It is on my end by, um, by the Zoom, uh, the Zoom, Zoom tools, can you see just the slide or are you seeing? Yeah, we just or... see the first one. I don't okay. know. It's... Okay, let me know if, 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 if something is blocking that from the Zoom. Okay, all right. We have entered the genomic era of addiction medicine. Exponential advancements in are being made globally at a staggering pace in neighboring fields which influence psychology. A review of advancements in molecular biology and psychiatric genomics will enlarge perspective of mental health over the lifespan. Implications for the practice of psychology could mean improved diagnostic protocol and treatment, improved treatment. The first addiction gene, the DRD2, was discovered in 1990 by Dr. Kenneth Blom and uh, Dr. Noble. In 2006, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, NIDA, reported it had determined 89 genes associated with addiction. By 2019, they reported 400 locations on the human genome with more than 566 gene variants affecting alcohol use disorder and smoking. Considering genetic and epigenetic environmental influences, it's estimated that at least 50% and sometimes up to 70% uh, for some individuals um, is the risk, um, is the ratio of genetics for risk of addiction development. Findings from twin studies, those who live together and those separated at birth, provide the foundation for molecular and behavioral genetics. Genet While genetics is the study of genes, epigenetics is the study of environmental factors which alter genetic material. 
So consider your D DNA as the blueprint for cellular repl replication. Your body is the hardware and your totality as a biological computer. The RNA is a strand of proteins made from amino acids and they act as a virus or a software program which can literally change your hardware or DNA. RNA transcription is the highest consciousness making changes in your best interest. But genes alone don't determine outcome. It's the interaction of genetic and epigenetic factors which influence outcome. When substance use release floods creates a flood of dopamine or a surge of dopamine, it upsets the delicate balance of neurotransmission, which involves a hundred different neurotransmitters. So quite naturally, our brain's response to this neurological emergency is to use RNA to transcribe your DNA. In this case, the epigenetic response is to lower dopamine availability, like turning down the volume knob it quite intentionally lowers the dopamine set point. This is known as an epigenetic response. Some think of, of it as the damage caused by drug addiction, but there's more information. For those who have pre-existing conditions like reward deficiency syndrome, which is a state of dopamine deficiency in the brain's reward cascade system, which predates the beginning of drug use or any mental health disorder manifestation, it would be known as an epigenetic insult because it makes an already intolerable situation worse. Although molecular biologists began in the 1970s, it wasn't until the 1990s that great strides began to be made in sequencing the three billion base pairs of DNA of the human genome. In 2003, the National Institutes of Health, National Human Genome Research Institute announced that the Human Genome Project was complete. And we have about 20,000 to 25,000 genes. Some are SNPs which stands for single nucleotide polymorphisms. And they're easier to identify because it's a single gene, but other genes are made up of longer segments of DNA. And they're a little more confusing. Functional genomics is a field of molecular biology, which focuses upon gene and amino acid protein interactions. Genetic mutations can affect human physiology and neurology, causing disease, and neurochemical imbalances in the brain. Advancements in the neuroscience of addiction have produced greater understanding of gene variances on dopamine neuroreceptor volume, density, and location. Addressing underlying dop dopaminergic issues of mental health disorders, which includes both substance use disorders and behavioral addictions, could improve the effectiveness of treatment. Advancements in neurobiology of addiction include discovery of biological markers for recovery and relapse and common underlying neurobiological similarities in many mental health disorders. Dr. Nora Valkow, the director of the National Institutes on Drug Abuse, released a statement more than a decade ago stating that there are similarities of neurobiological dysfunction underlying every mental health disorder. I'm sorry, give me just a moment. This is an overview of underlying neurobiology. Um, 
Reward deficiency syndrome, now reward dysfunction syndrome, is recognized as one, causal influence which is a neurobiological issue created by genetic mutation, which underlines all addictions, substance use and behavioral and mental health disorders. So most of them we're finding have a deficiency. Hype, and that's called hypodopaminergia. An example of this would be any of your drug addictions, ADHD, depression, PTSD. They generally are known to have a situation of not enough dopamine. It's also the case of too much dopamine. And we see this in bipolar and schizophrenic patients. And we've learned this year, um, and I myself am one of these, that has both. Generally, a, a, too, a dopamine deficiency, too little dopamine, and then in another brain center, too much dopamine. A little more complicated. I want you to look at these diagnostic categories from the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's written by the American Psychiatric Association for Psychiatrists and Psychologists. Some master's level clinicians or mental health nurse, nurse practitioners use it to, uh, for diagnosis purposes. Each one of these uh, labels or categories has been decided upon based upon clusters of symptoms and or behaviors, not underlying neurobiological causal influence. Traditional mental health and substance use disorder treatment does not include genetics, genomics, neuroscience, or neurobiology. And the level of prescribed medication, the, uh, the natural means of prescribed medication is by trial and error, not by identifying the appropriate channel of neurotransmission or the exact mechanism of action required for an individual's unique genome for their particular brain. So the meds that have been chosen by the doctors may not help and they may cause harm. Um, there've been a lot of deaths caused by pharmaceutical drugs, which cause suicidal ideation. And this is at a time when approximately 100 thousand Americans are dying from overdose every year. So to get to the bottom line, every one of these diagnoses on this slide are now considered endotypes, the end result of not treating the underlying neurobiological issue. Reward deficiency syndrome is known as the phenotype. Well, this is information that's uh, understood in the research world, but it hasn't yet entered the practitioner world. And it's my goal to help um, to help get this all the way to the front line. Um, we've known since the 1980s when behavioral process addictions were recognized that drugs were not the problem, that drugs don't cause addiction. And yes, that's what I said, Drugs do not cause addiction. Brains do. And the traditional treatment addresses behaviors or symptoms and the mind, but not really the brain. So the good news is a simple genetic addiction risk severity test called GARS for short can identify up to 10, 20, excuse me, 22 risk factors. And this test examines the 10 most common prominent genes in mental health issues and identifies variants or mutations over 11 alleles. I've tested myself and several family members and I'm using it for prevention with my two grandsons. We've traced common family genetics through four generations 
in which clusters of mental health disorders have influenced the lives of those I love. Right now, we're focused on prevention um, of other manifestations and um, other diseases known to occur over the lifespan that have a dopamine deficiency etiological root or causal influence. Let me show you what this looks like over the lifespan. I'm seeing it right now in my three-year-old grandson. He's a genius. Um, you know, when you hear about children, sometimes on the Osberger or autism spectrum, most people tend to think they have a, de de a developmental delay or a cognitive deficiency. But no, this also applies to the other end of the spectrum, to those who are genius. Um, but this is typically the time when ADD or ADHD may surface, okay? In some speech um, or developmental, developmental issues, dopamine irregularity, let me find this. I've, I've lost my place in my notes. Hold on. Okay, well, I'll just go ahead and wing it. In adolescence, um, you know, this, whatever the issues were in child, early childhood may continue to worsen, or they may just start showing up. There may be some social, emotional, developmental delay with someone with RDS that really, when there was no need for concern earlier on. And there are some examples of this being the beginning of personality disorders, impulse control disorders, um, contact disorders, but those are, are labels. Those are labels and categories created based on a category of symptoms. So I don't know how relevant they are in a changing world where the DNA, DSM will eventually um, start concentrating and focusing on underlying neurobiological commonalities. Okay, but by the time you're uh, let me just add also that substance use in adolescence is extremely um, concerning because the brain still hasn't developed. It won't finish developing until the age of 25. Now we've had addictions, substance use disorders, non-substance process behavioral addictions, and a lot of mental health disorder comorbidity starts showing up in early adulthood. That's when you first start seeing bipolar. Um, eating disorders, things like that. Um, so <laughs> those of us who are working in RDS um, are, are also concerned with much more than just mental health. I'm at middle age and um, the symptoms that started showing up for me um, have been involuntary movement, involuntary vocalizations, a weird kind of facial tics. Um, fortunately, they've gotten a lot better or, or have gone away completely since I started an amino acid uh, uh, pro dopamine regulator and started changing my diet and focusing on my tradition. And perhaps it's because of the medication that I'm getting. But one thing is certain that Parkinson's Deficiency is a product of dopamine depletion. Um, and there are other dopamine dementias. That doesn't necessarily mean that someone who has the genetic mutations or has RDS will end up um, with Parkinson's disease. But I want to stress the fact that it's better to start addressing RDS now than wait till later. Okay, the GARS is just one test. I mean, every area of medicine is, is rushing to create some kind of genetic screening for their specialty before somebody else beats them to the market. Um, because based on those genetics mutations, you can the right medication. You shouldn't be able to determine the neurotransmitter channel involved. And it's there's more than dopamine. Uh, there's seven, I know, that are involved in RDS. But we have 100 neurotransmitters altogether. So when I did my, jar, my jar, 
no, excuse me, my GARS analysis, I was surprised it was so simple. I only had a risk factor of five. So it wasn't that hard to figure out. I took each one of those those gene variants and got on the internet and cloud to the research databases and found out what they were correlational to. And I knew I needed a dopamine agonist and I consulted with a, um, a psychiatrist who had begun studying RDS because of his affiliation with myself and had learned to recognize RDS and some of his other clients. Um, so since he's the doctor who can prescribe medicine, he added a dopamine norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. So we're very micro dose, very tiny, tiny dose just to restart the dopamine system that, that really got shut down because of years of cocaine use and epigenetic response it's trying to regain some type of homeostasis in the brain. Okay, so you've got the pharmaceuticals and um, I, oh, I want to address the stimulant. Most people with uh, reward deficiency syndrome um, either have a genetic predisposition, which I do, but can also get adult ADHD as a result of drug use. So that's an epigenetic response. And what's required for that and what works best is a microdose. Okay, now that sometimes that seems to be counterintuitive for other models. When you're looking through the lens of the Minnesota model dated in the 1950s, that would be contraindicated. But if you're looking through the lens of the neurodevelopmental model from 2017, that's exactly right on. Um, some, you know, it's all about brains. Some people can take a stimulant and it speeds them up. And other individuals, their brains, if you give them a stimulant, it calms them down. So um, the intervention should target the etiological root. Um, so there are a lot of natural things you can do. Um, brain reward is, is yeah, I buy it on Amazon. It's expensive. Um, it's made by Victory Nutrition, and it's a uh, 26 of the 29 amino acids. And I take it out of the plastic capsule because the Lord knows I don't need any more plastic clogging up the cilia that that don't allow that keeps me from absorbing minerals. Um, and I put it in a non-citric juice solution, and I try to hold it under my tongue. So this is the sublingual way method, and it goes straight to the brain. And you can literally feel the difference. Um, several of my family members are on that. I thought this was interesting. Um, I'm still, I need to catch up and find my notes. I'm a little bit out of alignment here with those. Um, just give me a second. This is from a different study. It's the new GARS um, Criterion Validity Project. And I was fortunate enough to be included in that project. Dr. Blum is mentoring me and teaching me. Okay, a meta, here we are. Slide 10. A meta-analysis of 74,000 patients who were administered the GARS was found to have both reli reliability and, and validity. And I like the fact that it's a simple test. It's just 10 genes. And, you know, the DRD4, they look at that. That's called two different alleles of, alleles of that. And that's a little complicated. But they're just looking at 11 different factors. Okay, what this, um, and again, I state that mine, I thought I would probably have all of the risk factors. I was surprised when it came back at a five. Um, if you look at figure one, what do you see? I mean, there's a pretty normal bell curve. Um, it's a skewed a little bit to the right. Its mean is, what, nine? Um, and that's alcoholics. Figure two is um, has is pretty much the same. Uh, 
bell curve it may have a little, a little bit of outlier in some of the higher um, the higher frequency uh, tubes, but um, I found it interesting that it takes less genetic, or at least with considering the genes they test, that lower risk people with a lower risk score are more likely to have cocaine abuse, ADHD, and PTSD. And it takes more um, gene variations we're showing for the alcoholics or those with eating disorders. Their, their mean is eight. So, I mean, that, that might not be of interest to you, but I found it peculiar. Um, and I... It did so when I was studying uh, my family genetics because some with a greater risk um, for mental health disorders seem to be functioning better than some of us with a lower risk. So excuse me, Elizabeth. Excuse yes. me, sorry. Uh, the people said they cannot see the figures and what you are showing. I don't know if some delay in oh. your presentation. Okay, yeah, help me there. I've got a little line from the Zoom. Um, okay. Is it not big? Is it not big enough? I can't get rid of that line that's spreading. You know, the one that says chat and you share that's usually at the bottom. I don't know how to move that. So I can go back to the other ones. Is that what they want me to do? Go back to the other slide. It's because they. It, I think it's maybe some delays and it's not correspond with when you talking. I don't know if it's if it's uh, the connection is slow or something. Uh, are, are you seeing a slide right now that says bi-directional criterion validity for both GARS and the addiction are, severity? You we are? are seeing the GARS genetic screening is isoform psychiatric genomics. Oh my gosh. Wait a minute. You're seeing a different slide than I. You are muted too. You are muted. Okay, help me since you, you young people are good with technology. Have you seen? Okay, I don't. I think I want to go forward. Have you seen this slide? Yes. Well, okay, we see the GARS genetic screening isoform psychiatric genomic. If you want, maybe maybe Magdalene's group can uh, show your presentation and maybe runs much better. Genomics right now. We are in the genetic screening isoforms. Ah, so I wonder why it's only wonder why it's moving on my computer, but not on yours. I, I I'm a little bit lost to know exactly where you are, um, but I can continue with the verbal. Um, okay. Um, well, okay, so well, let me, um, I've got this on both, both computers here, so I just want to check so that I know where you are, because, you know, it's not so much that you have to see the graph. Okay, so. Do you want yeah. to uh, stop sharing and let the Magnus group to, to show your presentation? Oh. No, absolutely. If you can, if you can hear the audio, absolutely take over wherever you wherever you are. I'm so sorry that happened. Um, um, you say absolutely, absolutely. If you can pull up yours, then I can okay, just so add the. Just stop sharing. Okay. So I so I push then... stop sharing. Oh, it says new share resume. Oh, it went off share. Wait a minute. Zoom okay. share, new share. Well, did that help you use like that? <laughs> or wait a minute, am I bad? You are sharing the no, you are sharing the the PowerPoint. You can 
choose okay, this the the slideshow. Okay. Yeah, I will. I will somehow it got okay. See that works. Now. I'm sixty five. I'm not really good with computers. Don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry. I, I, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I do, okay, I'm going to choose from the beginning, and let's see. Now it's up. Okay, so um, I want to know how far along y'all have seen, so tell me when we get to the, is this where, I didn't, you got past this, right? Did, did yes. you see under neuroscience? all of that. Yes. Okay. I saw that. Saw that. Saw the life scan. Yes. Okay. Saw the nutraceutical and the pharmaceutical genomics. Okay. Yeah. We saw that. Okay. And these don't really matter. Um, point of it is, is you know, it seems like the GARS, which is the new science, seems to lend credibility to the old science addiction severity index and that it's bi-directional that the addiction severity index adds a uh, validity to the criterion of guards but i'm going to move right past that because the point i want to make is these are those are the con contributions from from neurology and genetics and now we're expanding psychological genomics so and that's basically I went into the research world because I couldn't find help for what was for what my issues were in the practitioner world. And so I started getting a lot of help and people were recommending that I study Dr. Blum. And here I am, have been able to do my own genetic screening with help, get the genomic, the pharmacogenomic intervention that is right for my brain. Okay, so I have been brought up to zero. Uh, hopi, dopamine homeostasis has been induced. So here I am, literally, at a point where my brain is stable enough that I can do the hard work. I can do the psychological work on my personal pathology and then move on to psychologies of well-being. But there are a couple of things we needed to add, and, and I'm I'm grateful that I'm the one who's able to bring them. Um, you know, we've all been looking at addiction through the eyes or the lens of the 12-step model. Well, this is a new paradigm. This is the RDS um, model or paradigm um, that focuses on underlying neurological issues, which, which, to be honest, they I think that's what makes people relapse. You know, when they come out of treatment, they're clean, but 60% are going to relapse immediately and 90% in a year. And unfortunately, they, some, some of the statistics I've heard from the government, one will be clean and the rest will be dead. So if we can, if I can help another person who suffers, well, it's not really dual diagnosis anymore. Um, that's what the layperson world would call it. In the scientific world, we, we're looking at clusters of mental health disorders that have commonalities like dopamine depletion or dopamine surplus. So reward deficiency syndrome paradigm psychoeducation is just a way to explain it. It gives you a new lens and a new something else to focus on. And I'm, I believe it would be really helpful for families um, because they too have been immersed in the in the twelve step dialogue. I mean, that industry is controlling the narrative. Model created in 1950 is controlling the narrative, and science has moved on to the genomic era. And if we could just somehow get the practitioner world to provide opportunity. For what science has brought may save lives. It certainly saved mine. So we add to that, or I have added to that, a war deficiency syndrome treatment plan and a, and a, and a therapy called solution focused brief intervention and a severity of symptom scale. And I don't want to go into too much detail. I don't want to bore you with that. Um, but uh, the symptom scale is, I, I uh, 
looked at a, a scale called chronic abstinence. And it was about addicts who they just, their fingernails were clawing the um, blackboard. They didn't feel better after treatment. And it's pretty obvious you were missing something in that case. And it's pretty obvious that they're about to relapse because of these conditions that somehow we're not addressing or the industry is not addressing. If you keep, so I, uh, I thought, oh, wow, why don't I add those symptoms to all the ones, other ones I'm feeling from bipolar up and down, craving and impulsivity, chronic pain, and some new ones that y'all don't know about, anhedonia and dysphoria. So I created this little scale and uh, list the symptoms that goes from 10 to zero. And I, I chart my, the intensity of my symptoms. Every day I still do it. You know, in our research, uh, we're doing the baseline and it's all tens over the top and watching things. And so I kind of use it to gauge how I'm doing. And it's wonderful to see the, the uh, the severity go down. We expect to see, and this is just a chart. What you're seeing here would be what if we graphed um, all each one of those daily uh, severity of symptom scales over a year, what the person might see. Well, I would expect the um, bipolar mood swings um, to to become smaller in range, not as high, not as low. Hopefully, anhedonia would go down. Now, anhedonia is something that you might not have heard before. There's a medical definition that says it's the inability to experience pleasure. But as a patient, I I want to I want to give you more information. If you had an X and Y axis, by that definition, it, anhedonia would be a zero. It's been my experience that anhedonia is below zero. It's um. It's an ongoing stress and insatiability where you're always reaching for something. You don't quite know what's wrong. So I usually drink for a cup, reach for a cup of coffee, a cigarette, or something with sugar in it. Um, if I'm in active addiction, you know, I would be reaching for a drug, a, 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 an illicit drug. But this undercurrent of stress has a way of igniting into a rage called dysphoria it just you just snap and the people that have rds addictions and mental health disorders that is what happens right before you go looking for the drug that you always chose to calm the war inside you know and for people like us pleasures off the table i mean maybe a massage is pleasurable but we're just trying to get up to zero Okay, so I, you know, I, in my notes, I, I was, I have a long list of the instructions and how to do it in more detail, but I, I think if you want to know about that, just call us and we'll be happy to help you devise your own, um, but I'm going to move on. Um, now, this is a scale that Dr. Biroat, um, can you see the top or is there anything um, blocking the title? Anyone? Can you hear me? Yeah, we saw the title. Okay, you do. Okay. Okay, well, Dr. Blum is this, they're trying to lay out what is happening. I'm going to go down here right to the right in the green. They just finished an RX, creating an RDSQ29 questionnaire, and it's a simple test. It's, it's a four point Likert scale. Okay, and it just asks what's true for you. And, you know, it, tells the clinician whether or not they need to investigate further, whether or not it's worth spending the money to get the um, the green gene screen. Um, okay, so um, they started out thinking it was an umbrella term for both substance and um, for behavioral addictions, but we know it's so much more now. It just covers almost every mental health disorder. And Dr. Blum calls it a, psych, a, a disorder, psychological based disorder having genetic polymorphic antecedents and epigenetic insults. I think it's physiological as well, um, from my experience. And, and I guess that's what I have to contribute as a scholar and a 
a doctoral student and, and as a researcher myself, I also have the perspective of patient and and patient, which has been round and round in a system that didn't really address my issues. So um, they're just laying out the treatment plan, this the solution, the focus brief therapy, and we don't need to really go through this. Um, this is in that journal article that's laid out that references 181 uh, different research studies. Um, but I'm here to, to really to uh, speak to the heart of the matter. There's circles of truth, in my opinion. Um, you know, you can, I can stand in my position and believe with from my perspective I'm right and argue with someone who's 180 degrees away from me. But it's been my experience that if we all kind of stood on a point in a 360 degree circle, that if we were respectful with each and every person's perspective, that we would gain a larger truth, a, a bigger understanding. And we'd have more pieces of the puzzle. So we've got, we've got Hazelton, Hazel, who took people into her den to clean up. And what a miracle that is that they, that in the 1950s, they were able to, to standardize treatment and AA has spread all over the world. And I am just so grateful for that. But I certainly wouldn't want to use the big book to treat my psychiatric, my <laughs> psychiatric nomic issues you know i need brain science as well the there is nothing better than the family and the camaraderie of the program okay but i'm not deluding myself that those 12 steps are going to correct um neurological imbalances based on brain mutations now they're going to make me a better person huh, a nicer person Okay, and in the 1980s, uh, well, it was really the 60s, but it didn't get any attention until the 80s, the harm reduction model. Well, that's, uh, SAMHSA's giving away a lot of grant money right now for people to investigate that. And it kind of makes sense because there are, there is a subpopulation that is able to address their issues and return to balance. Um, and, and, and just from my own experience, I was in Dallas in the 90s. I and trying. I picked up one white chip in AA, and and 90 days later, or I think I got a 90 day chip. 90 days, 90 days, 90 days. So I felt like a failure by looking through the lens of the Minnesota model. But if I looked at through it through the lens of the harm reduction model, it would be way to go, girl. 361 days clean, four days using, what an improvement. So based upon, and, and psychology uses that a lot. Uh, psychiatrists use that a lot. Um, not Blum and a, a bunch of his team members created the biogenetic model in the year 2000. I mean, Nine, it was 1990 that the first uh, alcohol gene drug was discovered. So the, the scientists and the geneticists and the epigeneticists are, are, are at work and they're so far ahead of us that, that they created that model. And um, I've already stated in another slide that DNA is estimated to be 50% of the causal influence with epigenetics, the other 50%. And that proper treatment for whatever it is, addiction or mental health disorders, needs to, the neurological treatment must address the etiological root of the underlying neurobiology to treat the cause. There's no getting around that. If somebody only has a behavioral problem that they've learned, they can unlearn it, okay? But if there's more to it, more complexity, um, and the government says there is that the people just don't know that they, they have at least one mental health disorder diagnostic, either in treatment or over their lifespan. But in reality, 
if they've got RDS, they're going to have many. But those diagnoses, as I've tried to say before, are in endotypes. They're symptoms. We get down to the to the treating the brain. Those mental problems are going to not conceptualization of those mental problems are going to change. So those are the models that we have, and there's more models. But I want to talk about the new paradigm shift because we need it. And I have already addressed the one on the right, the RDS genetic antecedent and epigenetic insults, which is solid science. And I'm so grateful it saved my life. And it's what I'm focusing on. And none of the team working on it is getting paid. This is all from the heart. Okay, but I'm going to go back to the, to the new paradigm on the left. A cognitive um, psychologist who offers a rational recovery group every morning at 7 a.m. And he talks about self-love. And it's his philosophy that if we loved ourselves, we wouldn't be harming ourselves. With drugs, chemicals, sugar, by watching media or or videos that weren't edifying. We wouldn't be around people that are stressing us out. If we truly loved ourselves, we would uh, reverently hold ourselves um, in a way that separated us from things that denigrated us or harmed us. So um, uh, maybe I didn't say that right, but um, he's writing a book upon it. And I just wish that somehow, okay, I want to, I want to go back to this circle in the middle. I used to present that in a linear uh, picture in some of my um, earlier presentations, you know, starting with the dates. And that was my bias. That was my bias as a patient, feeling like this is outdated and this is relevant. But as I gain perspective, I think we need all of them. I think we need to circle up, come together and do the best we can. But it's obvious that, well, you know, and they're calling it treatment failure. And I don't know if that's, if that's fair because the 12 step brings them in, cleans them up, stabilizes them, gets them in a pattern of eating better and being clean and going to meetings and starting out the group. And that's necessary. What we don't have is a phase two. Um, and, and there's no law that says the 12 step treatment centers have to provide a, a phase two, but somebody does. And it wouldn't be easier to just do that RDSQ 29 when they did their entry end up paperwork. And if they needed a GARS test, it could be done there. And then, you know, it takes about three weeks to get it back. And if they do have serious issues and they want more help, uh, they can begin the RDS um, protocol. It can be done virtually. And we're doing it right here. I'm doing it. Um, I'm doing it under L Research um, and L Resource. Um, now, none of those are businesses selling anything. Um, L Research is just a list of my research contributions. Go to e -L -E -L -L -E dot lresource.com for a list of those. But we're planning a couple of, um, maybe a next slide. Uh, we're, uh, let me jump around. We've got a couple of things in, in the works here. There's a qualitative study that I think will be next. I'd like to interview everyone who has a substance use disorder and dual diagnosis for your experience with the traditional treatment, which means 12-step treatment and uh, prescription by trial and error. And I want you to tell me whatever you need to tell me about it, okay? Um, there's a lot of hurt that goes on when... Um, Okay, thank you for telling me. The if you call, if you're interested, call 336-608-0881. Um, because we're recruiting right now, actively recruiting. And that's the contact information. Um, 
I just want to say to all those who are suffering, who who haven't found everything they need with the resources that are available, if if you're interested, perhaps we can help and get you in a case study and get you, certainly get you into dopamine homeostasis. But thank you so much for the opportunity to present and to Magnus Group and everybody out there. And thank you for your time.